Good afternoon. My name is Leandra Clark. I am a doctoral student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I'm so honored today to be able to interview the esteemed Joe White about his involvement in ABCI, his life story, um, his history. Um, Dr. White, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very Leandra. much. Thank you for being here. So I want to start off just by hearing a little bit about uh, your personal story, where you're from, um, how you got to where you are today. But let's start with where you're from, your background. Well, I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I was okay. actually born in Lincoln, Nebraska, but my family moved to Minneapolis when I was an infant. And then my parents broke up and I have two older siblings. Mm -hmm. But for the first 17 years of my life, I was a sunburnt Swede. There weren't many <laughs> colored people or Negroes in Minneapolis. Okay. And my goal as I moved through high school was to be a waiter in a big hotel. Mm -hmm. And I had been a waiter in a hotel in Minneapolis, and I worked on the trains in the summer because all the big time white folks traveled by train back then. So I would work extra help. And so I would work from Minneapolis to Seattle, one day layover, turn around, come back. So I was having a lot of fun. It wasn't work to me. Mm -hmm. But what happened, my mother became concerned that she thought I was beginning to drift toward the streets. I wasn't actually in the street, but she didn't like the company I was keeping, and she didn't like my girlfriend, who became the singer Prince's mother, Maddie Dell. And so she shipped me to California a week after I graduated from high school. Wow. Shipped me to San Francisco. And at that time, no black waiters were allowed in the waiters union. So here I was wanting to be a waiter. Mm -hmm. I couldn't break the barrier. I was back being a busboy. I was all bent out of shape. They had started a war in Korea, so I was on the streets. And I got identity problems and life adjustment problems. So my aunt, who was a young social worker, 10 years older than me, said, well, maybe the way to solve your problems is to take another pathway and go to college. And I said, well, why not? I mean, I wasn't working as a waiter, and that path was blocked legally for me. So she took me to San Francisco State, which was still almost in the hood. It was right off a black district called Fillmore. Okay. She took me up there on the 22 bus, and I was a week late, but she talked to the lady. And unbeknownst to me, I had gone to a college prep high school, so I had all the requirements. And there was no in-state fees, no out-of-state fees. California wow. higher education was free, $14.50. Wow. If you didn't have the $14, the dean would sign a waiver for you, and you had a semester to pay the money back. Then I had been a jive-time athlete in high school. Brothers be playing basketball and running track. So they got me a job working in the playground down in the hood. Wow. So now I'm going to school, working in the playground, and then I had a military deferment for four years because everybody had to do 24 months. So then I was going to school and working at the playground. So I got fascinated with this psychology thing, Pavlov's dog and the unconscious mind. And so my advisor looked at my grades and there were C plus. And like any young black male at that time, I thought that was the greatest. I'm a C plus student, I'm going to college, I ain't in trouble. And the man told me, if you want to go into psychology, two things. First, they don't have any Negroes in this field. Mm -hmm. And second, not with these grades. So now you straighten up the grades, and then we'll worry about the rest. And this like, is a high school counselor? No, it's a college. It's a college counselor. I'm in oh, college wow. now. Okay. I'm in college, and I'm a psych major. Okay. And so I'm clicking along as a C-plus student, but I got interested in this thing, psychology, and then he explained graduate school to me. I didn't even know there was anything like that. So he told me if I really wanted to be in this field, that I had to clean up my act, and then we had this Negro business. Mm -hmm. So then I finished college, did my 24 months in the military, and I didn't get into grad school the first time around. Didn't get into PhD. So the same people at San Francisco State set me down again, and they said, well, look, we just started a master's degree program. So why don't you come in this master's program, and then we'll take care of the rest of it. You just trust us. So I went into master's, and then two years later, they got me into Michigan State, got me to Colorado, too. And I had a US Public Health Fellowship, wow. and I had the GI Bill, 
and I had a wife and two kids, and they moved me into married housing. And there was no problem. I had plenty enough money because I taught at a junior college or worked at child guidance clinic, whatever. So I ended up coming through the clinical program at Michigan State, and I was the first and only Negro mm -hmm. for two years. And then they let me invite some more people to come back there with me. So tell me more about your experience as being one of the only Negroes at this program. Well, at first they were a little, shall we say, hesitant in that they didn't think that colored Negro students really had the capacity to do advanced graduate work. Okay. And uh, they were not too subtle about it either because I mentioned to you earlier that I had got a master's degree. Mm -hmm. Well, in the hope that I just might get into a PhD program while I was on the master's, I took every extra course I could find, advanced statistics, history of system. So I essentially was doing a first year PhD right. on my own. So when I got to Michigan State, I went in there and I said, look here, I've had, you know, advanced statistics, I've had history and systems, et cetera, et cetera, experimental psych, so I'd like for you to waiver some of these classes. Now, I knew they weren't going to do it. So they told me, now look here, if you're going to get a PhD from this school, you have to take these courses, and beside, Negroes have trouble in higher math, and we can't start you in the most advanced part of the statistics. I said, well, okay, that's cool with me. You know, y'all white folks, that's what I said to myself, <laughs> you know, but wait, you don't know what's going to happen to you. Mm. So putting me back in the same classes I already had, which I had already gotten an A in, right. there was no comparison between me and the other students. Right. So then they flipped over, and I was the smartest little Negro they ever saw. They waved everything. I was only there three years, finished internship, dissertation, everything. Wow. I was a boy. That's amazing. I was their boy. Now we, in the next part, we had a little, shall we say, difference of opinion when the 60s came along. Okay. And when I left the program, I was what you call a black Anglo-Saxon. I was the nicest Negro you ever wanted to see. Hmm. I was married with three children, a stay-at-home wife. I had a PhD. I had done my two years in the military. I would never been in trouble. And I thought I had climbed the mountain. I really did. I really, really did. Till I came back to California in 1962, and I faced two problems. I had to rent a house for these children and this wife, or buy one, and that was a no-no in Long Beach, California. Mm. And I had to rent an office. So now I gotta get involved in lawsuits. I gotta start the Fair Housing Foundation. So I went from being the nicest Negro to being a militant Negro. Right. All of trying to exercise my rights, and I was confused on top of all that. So. That was the the early years. So the first 28 years just went off like clockwork. I mean, I just followed one pathway, and when that one got blocked, did another one. And I have no bad vibes against America till after I got that PhD. So tell us about that. So you had your PhD. You went from a nice black man to a militant black man. What are some of the things, or what are some of the changes that happened right after? Tell us about that shift. Well, the shift was as I came up against these barriers, mm -hmm. I began to understand that it wasn't just happening to me. It was happening to other so-called Negroes, colored people, then we were becoming black. It was a system thing, top to bottom, left to right. And apparently, I had been operating with blinders, tunnel vision, my first 28 years. You know, I must have known these things existed. You know, and I talked to Malcolm X several times when I was a graduate student because his brother was one of the 10 black graduate students at Michigan State. There were 10 of us among 20,000. So when Malcolm would come to Detroit to preach at the mosque, he was from Lansing, Michigan. He would come over to Michigan State to talk to his brother, who was in the master's program in social work. And Malcolm tried to tell me what was going to go down. Hmm. He said, you think you're getting this PhD and you're going to be America's special Negro or you're going to be Dr. Nigger just like the rest of us when you finish. I said, oh, no, 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 we the white man, special Negro. I mean, he brought me all the way here from California and gave me a U.S. Public Health Fellowship. I mean, I must be somebody. Mm -hmm. So our attitude was we was Du Bois' talented 10th. Mm -hmm. 
and Malcolm was trying to tell you and say, there's another reality out there waiting for you, son. And you're going to come up against it, and there's nowhere to run, baby, nowhere to hide. So then I started listening to the likes of Martin Luther King and getting involved in marching and demonstrating and picketing and making speeches and this and that. So I went from kind of like, and I had no knowledge of what was happening to me because there was no Bill Cross then. So I went from the pre-encounter stage <laughs> to the encounter stage mm -hmm. to the immersion stage. Wow. And so we would stay up all night drinking wine and cook a big old pot of stew, talk about how bad white folks are and how they had enslaved our grandmother, raped her, and took us from Africa mm. to black, 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 black. My wife ran off and left me, got tired of all this black. Then I got a girlfriend, she ran off and left me too. Black, 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 black. So then um, we come to 1968 with black, black, black. And I had been appointed Dean of Undergraduate Studies at San Francisco State. So all that occurred about the time of the 68 convention. So when we got to town, I'm the Dean, so I got a half a suite, right? Mm. So I rounds up the brothers, there was about 10 or 12 of us, and I got a big mouth, so I announced it all over town that there was going to be this meeting. So then it started with 12 of us, then some social workers came, then some ministers came, then some girlfriends and some ex-girlfriends, graduates, <laughs> undergrads, and Wade was an undergrad. So pretty soon, we got people all down the hall. Mm -hmm. So over that four days, four things happened over that Labor Day weekend. Connectedness, deconstruction, creativity, and let's see, connectedness, deconstruction, confrontation, and creativity. Those were the four themes of that four days. So connectedness, we had to get in the room, and when you get that many black people back in the 60s, everybody got to testify and bear witness. <laughs> so by that, takes up four or five hours. Right. So it's three o'clock in the morning, the fire marshal is telling me I got to get people out of the hallway because everybody got to testify and bear witness, and then we got to back up as new people come in. So that was phase one. Then phase two was the deconstruction. The deconstruction was, look, psychology is part of America. Black people are invisible in America, they're invisible in psychology. Psychology is part of America. In America, black people are considered to be inferior, dumb, slow, childlike. Same thing in psychology, you got low IQ, can't do a complex stat. We said, now how the hell did this happen? How did you create a so-called science come up with the same conclusions about black people that exist in society. And then they tried to argue, well, this is science. We said, no, 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 this is not no science. This is the sociology of knowledge. That's what this is. And you created a science that reflects the beliefs of the society. And it happened in anatomy, happened in physiology, biology. Y'all been running around here since we came here finding some kind of science that said we were inferior. So in the sociology of knowledge, popular beliefs are reproduced in science. Hmm. So then we had this uh, confrontation with APA. It was a big old room like this. And they sat on one side, and then the 12 of us sat on another. And we asked them a simple question. Why would you create a science that said we was inferior and reproduce the popular beliefs? And then the meeting broke down, and the mother word was used, and fist fights almost broke out. So then we left from the meeting. And the creative part of the meeting afterward was, look, we can't depend on them to define us. We had read at Ralph Ellison who said, when I discover who I am, mm -hmm. I will be free. Right. Stokely Carmichael, the black power and all. So we said, now we got to take charge and define ourselves, define our own psychology, build our own psychology. We had four requirements, that it would be strength-based, that it would represent the voice of the people, that it would belong to the people. Strength base, represent the voice of the people, belong to the people, and it would be written in an understandable manner. Not like the Journal of Psychology or something. Mm -hmm. So my first article appeared in Ebony and that was deliberate. I wanted the people in the hood to know this thing existed called black psychology. 
and we want it to represent the voice of the people rather than the voice of the Ivy Tower. So then we got started, and then subsequently the Asian dude said, well, no, 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 I don't want white people to find in me, and they created the Asian psychology. Right. Then the Chicano, same thing, then women, then gays. And so what we're saying is there are multiple realities in America, multiple realities in psychology, and no one group should try to define it for everybody else from their experience. That's all we said. But that was revolutionary. And then I had a falling out with the people at Michigan State because they said I was leading this black movement and they had raised me up to be a nice Negro and now I was calling people the mother word. They put it all on to me. Kenneth Clark was all upset with me and this and that. So time heals everything. So 10 years ago, they had the 50th anniversary of the establishment of the PhD in clinical at Michigan State. They invited me back, told me I was their boy, and gave me the award for the best student of 50 years. I jumped up on that stage, two of my professors, both dead now, and said they put the idea of black psychology up in my mind. And they ain't done nothing. So anyhow, that's what happened. Wow. That's so such you a, got about a few minutes, so go ahead. <laughs> That's such a rich history and, and, and legacy, and we know that um, founding AVSI, you being one of the founding members, that's that's just of crucial importance um, to be able to um, track historically. So I want to hear more about your involvement across the years. You know, we know you founded and we hear the story, um, but how has it evolved for you? Well, how it evolved was everybody had a job. My job and black people don't define it on paper, was conceptual. Okay. They wanted me to kind of lay out the parameters of this field called black psychology. So then I did the Ebony article, then 10 years went by and I don't know what was going on in my mind, but then I finally wrote the first book on black psychology that was a single author book. So I tried to lay out the parameters as they existed in mental health, family, education, worldview, mm -hmm. and so on. And I figure if I laid the parameters out, then others would come behind me and fill in the spaces. So that's what happened. Second, because I was a teacher, uh, I felt it was my job to facilitate the development of the next generation of black psychologists, which actually now is two and now three generations. So the mentoring philosophy was to one is everybody that I've mentored internalized hopefully a responsibility for mentoring somebody else. So if I produced one student, then they produced five or six more right. who produced five or six more. So everybody from Irvine, and I've seen 98% of them, left with an internalized definition of mentoring. The second thing was that wherever I go, I try to make contact with young people. For example, I've been retired 14 years, but now I go around speaking as a nickel and dime, all-purpose minority speaker, so when they can't <laughs> get Akbar to call me. But, anyway, uh, but wherever I go, I try to define the schedule so that I have plenty of time with graduates and undergraduates. So that's why I don't use the Speakers Bureau, because they won't leave you there. They want you to make your speech, and you got to get across the bay and make another speech, and then go down to Stanford and make another one, whereas I want to hang around. Mm -hmm. So I deliberately tell the dean I want a student to pick me up, a couple students be at the hotel, have dinner, whatever, and I do five and ten minute mentoring, mm -hmm. and then they can follow me up by email. Mm -hmm. So over the years, uh, I've hand-touched by me over a hundred PhDs. Wow, that's amazing. That's people that I have reached out and touched, and sometimes it only takes a few minutes. Right. You know, somebody will set me down and now they know they've only got 20 or 30 minutes. So they're real clear when they sit down with me. You know, they ask me real clear questions about internship, about getting financial help, about getting tenured, this, that, and the other. And I know that you've kind of nicknamed this your, your freedom train, the is freedom that right? Train, okay. That you get on the freedom train and you'll get more choices. That's right. You know, and I try to make it real clear and we've picked out maybe eight or nine schools that we work with and all those schools, those kids will get a free ride for four years, four or five, whatever mm -hmm. it takes. And then, of course, I show up periodically at the school and, you know, nonverbal is more powerful than verbal. So when I show up, they know they better not be messing with these kids, you know. <laughs> right. So I, all I have to do is walk through the hall. I have to, mm -hmm. How y'all doing? It's this and that. So they say, well, this is one of Joe's folks. I say, okay, y'all cool. Well, you know, I'm on nobody's case, but I'm just around here. Mm -hmm. So forth. So I make sure 
that in my travels I'd be checking on them where they are. Amazing. So it's worked out fine. So Dr. White, can you tell us, um, as you speak to students and as you, you mentor students and, and early professionals and kind of um, have this freedom train, um, what are some of the challenges you think that are facing African American students today? Well, first of all, I try to create the power within because I see them as the agents of their own change, number one, so that I tell them, first of all, find something that fascinates you mm -hmm. in psychology and pursue that. Second thing is, outwork every other student in the program. If you outwork everybody, you will be all right. <laughs> you know, so when I was at Michigan State, we had a graduate reading library, and if I would drive there at by there at night in the middle of that snow and see that light on, I knew there was a graduate student in there studying. So I'd call my wife on a payphone and say, look here, I gotta go in the grad reading room, you know, because that white boy's not gonna outwork me. You see me, you know, I might laugh and joke, but I'm gonna work. And third, you have to understand, especially as a young professor, the politics of the program without getting drowned in it. Mm. You know, so that you think about the politics more than you think about your work. You know, you have to understand, you know, if there are people out to get you or this, that, and the other. But I still think that excellence will prevail over politics. I believe that. Yeah. And you have to find somebody to protect you. So if there's no black senior people, then you make sure you're attached to a black senior person outside of your particular campus. Because uh, in most campuses, as he knows, you can have uh, extra people, outside people who are experts on your committee and this and that. You know, so that, uh, that, that your review isn't confined to the people who are physically on your campus. And also, I had a stint in politics too, which I love, but I can't do everything. So I was with Bobby Kennedy. Okay. And I uh, got in through that network through Willie Brown. And uh, because of that network and because of Willie, then I was able to create the educational opportunities programs here in California system-wide, and 300,000 students have gone through those programs wow. in the last, uh, since 1968. And then I was, because of my political involvement, I was chair of the licensing board and so on. So you had to have a little juice so mm -hmm. we connected to the people with the juice. Right. So as we celebrate 40 years of ABCI and, and you being a founding member, um, where, uh, what are some of the ideas and what is the direction that you want to see the organization take okay. at this point? What I want to see the organization do now is I think now we have established our identity. We are Africans, okay? You see that? People marching in, playing drums. So we have established an identity. Now we're 40 years old, so we have a solid identity. Now that we have a solid identity, a good solid organization, it's time for us now to begin to address the needs of black people. So we got needs of the brother right in this neighborhood going to prison. We need to address that. Mm -hmm. We got mental health needs. We got needs of, you looked around at that stage this morning, now why aren't there more black males surviving to go to graduate school? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not against sisters, I got three girls, and two of them is in higher education. But uh, let's get this balance thing going. Uh, what are our needs when it comes to moving people up into corporate structure? So we need to go back to the community, let them define what their needs are, then we hook that to a value system and identity and make the two meet. So when I go around the country, like I've been up in Seattle and Portland, I'm looking around and I'm living in California and they're flying me way up there and I'm saying, now where are mm -hmm. the psychologists? What, what are they doing? And so forth. So I think that in the next 10 years, we need to strengthen the pipeline of young people coming into psychology, especially uh, males, and we need to address the needs of the community as the community defines their needs. Okay. Right. And then I think somehow we have to figure out in the next two years, from a psychological point of view, what is this Obama phenomenon, phenomenon all about? Hmm. in terms of the identity spectrum. Okay. What, what, what's going on that a brother can come up to this level mm -hmm. in this country, a brother who is a fusion of Africa and America, mm -hmm. and what, what, what is going on? 
And Bob Chrisman was here last night. He's the editor of the Black Scholar. And their current edition is on Obama. And they're going to do another one afterward. And then I want him to do a psychological one after that. Have a bunch of psychologists sat down. Oh, that would be amazing. OK. That's wonderful. So considering um, the, changing political, the changing political climate, what are your, your final thoughts for us? My final thoughts are, on the positive side, we need to strengthen the jedna or the mentorship of our children, especially our male children, from the ages of five and six forward, to get them over that hump, to get them through high school without getting pregnant, without going to jail, and so on, because there is plenty of opportunity out there. At the same time, we have to make sure that this race issue gets dealt with and discussed in America, because if Obama becomes president, what they're going to try and say is, there's no more problem. Mm -hmm. See, this brother made it, mm -hmm. and the rest of these kids can too. But the society has to take some responsibility for this race piece and begin to change its structures. So we have to do our part in terms of taking responsibility, but there has to be some structural changes in the society so that these young people can land on their feet at 22, 23 with some skills. And that's where you all come in. Yes, we do. Well, thank you, Dr. White. I, as a student, am definitely inspired by your work, by your life story, and I'm so glad that you shared it with us today. But remember, I started out wanting to be a waiter. You did. And I couldn't get into union. Mm. So <laughs> I guess I learned from that is if one door closes, you might as well try to find another one that opened it up. I'm sure glad you did. Again, this is Leandra Clark. I'm the chair-elect of the Student Circle of ABSI. I just finished interviewing Joe White. Thank you so much for watching.